Daw Nation, welcome to this episode of In The Daw with Kiro, breaking down their song, Better Now. In this episode, you're going to learn about creating a cover for a song, finding your own mixing style, and adding swing to your drop rhythms. Just so you know, we recreated the bass preset that Kiro talks about in this episode, and we're giving it away for free. Link in the description. But we're going to get into the episode right now. Welcome everyone to this week of In The Da. We're so honored to be able to have Luke and Jordan from Kiro. How are you guys doing today? Doing good, man. Thank you. Thanks for having us. We got Multiplier here and we got Quinn here. Quinn is a patron. This is something that we've just been recently doing, bringing patrons onto the episode. So if you're interested in that, there's a link in the description for the Patreon. Where did this song begin? How did this start? Let's start at the very beginning. So we got approached by this company called Curate Records that uh, does an annual cover compilation thing like last year they had adventure club and cruella and CeeLo green and a couple of other big artists do uh covers of like big well-known songs we got approached by them and asked if we wanted to do one we were like sure we've never done something like this could be a cool opportunity to put like a spin on like one of our favorite tracks and we, we could literally pick anything and we're both huge post malone fans at the time that we started this better now was like the most poppin hot song in the world and so we were like all right kind of a no-brainer let's just see if we could do this one it all came together incredibly quickly what kind of like sets it apart from from some of the other stuff that we've done where we're working with vocals as far as i can remember correct me if i'm wrong but all of those are basically like we do an instrumental verse and then we get someone to record on it um, because this was a cover it's the other way around and it, it gives you an, an interesting angle to make something around a vocal, especially in this case, working around uh, something from, from Post Malone. It definitely had some challenges that came with it. I think the, one of the bigger ones was the key track was written in, or like the scale, turning it from something major into something minor. And I think early on it, we just left it in that, but then, yeah, this just ended up lending itself much better for something that fits our style, and I think, I think it ended up working pretty well, but that was a bit of a gamble. Like, is this is this even going to work, or is it going to take away the entire kind of like original feel of the of the track? But I think I think we ended up with something that that works quite nicely. So, did you get the stems from the Post Malone song? Um, no, everything everything that's in here is like from us from scratch. We we do have. I think it's still in here somewhere, like the like a, a Post Malone acapella that we just used for reference. But everything, everything in here is like this custom. The vocals that you hear on the record itself as well, they're not Post's original vocals. So when you start with something like this, walk me through. What is the very first thing you do? Do you start with the drums? Do you start with the melody? The sound design? Like, what's the what's the first thing of your workflow? It kind of depends. For me, it's sometimes a chord progression. Sometimes it's an idea for a melody that usually usually is the case when I'm working on on something that either stays an instrumental or doesn't get a vocal until like late in the process. On this one, I think it was the kind of like drum groove that you can hear in the intro here. I'll just play a bit. You probably think that you are better now, better now. You only say that because I'm not around, not around. You know I never meant to let you down. Halftime kind of like rhythm to it. This, this was kind of like one of the first things that came together around the original Post Malone a cappella. That was pretty much all that w- that was there. Just that and some like some synth work to go with it. And then I think the drop kind of came together after I had sent something to Luke already. So just so that I understand what you're saying. So most of the time when you're starting a song, you start with the chord progression or a melody. This time though, you started with the drums and then you moved into the drop. Was that kind of the logical sequence of things? Yeah, kind of. I think it, it helped that we already had an acapella to work from. When when that's not there, I think it's tough to to start out with drums unless you already have a bit of like a specific idea or you really sit down and take your time to do it. For me personally, it's easier in that case to, to start out with something. I think we both work better starting with a melody or a chord progression because like Jordan said, it's an acapella. There's already like a melody and an implied chord progression that could be there when you write a chord progression it's not just chords like you know you can apply a certain like rhythm and swing to the chord progression itself and then you get your kind of like drum rhythm from there or 
if you want to force a drum rhythm on that later. <laughs> so do you tend to mix as you go or almost write the song first and then treat mixing as a separate step afterwards? I think most of the time we're just we're mixing as we go. I, I think both of us are are way too picky with how th things sound to just leave it all unmixed as we work. I, I find myself hard pressed to find producers these days who leave mixing Till the very last step, I think most people are just mixing as they go. Mastering is a different thing. Like at the at the very end, like you can tweak the mix or just the overall loudness of the track to to match whatever you think it needs to be. But mixing is kind of like a as we go thing. There's, there's definitely like right before we we do start the master, and there's definitely like kind of things that we save for last. We're not gonna like be r really nitpicky on like oh this this snare should be one dB quieter or louder. That's that's kind of like stuff that we say for when we know that everything is in place. Most of the things we do, yeah, it just kind of goes naturally. It's just uh, something we do along the way. And the more experience you, you build as well in music production, I think that's something you kind of pick up on. You know, you know what you like, you know what you want. And after building enough experience, you usually kind of know how to, to get that out of your, your sounds as well. And that definitely helps. Like it, 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 it isn't really tedious anymore. You just do it. It's like you do it in autopilot. If anything, that's a huge part of being an artist that has their own sound as well. Because a lot of that comes down to what the mix down sounds like. If you are your own artist and you're producing your own music, you should have your own mix style that works for what you make. I think Skrillex is always a good example because I, I feel like you can spot a Skrillex record anywhere without seeing his name on there because he has a very defined mix style. And when you listen to like the unfinished whips and demos and things, it's clearly not fully mixed and mastered, but you can totally tell that it's still him because his mix style is super prevalent. And that's obviously something he's doing along the way, either consciously or unconsciously. So what do you think defines your guys' mix style? Like what elements would you say? Yep, that's ours. I think kind of like comparing it to the way other people mix or like when they're working on stuff and they send over ideas, you know, or like they're they're looking for specific feedback while they're working on something. Okay, and comparing it to what we do, I think we, we just we we like that nice kind of like rounded out low end. We're kind of over like the loudness war as well. We try to not push everything to the absolute max could rather leave some room and i think there's definitely stuff out there that sounds maybe almost like clear or crispier in a way i don't know if that's the right term but like there, there I, there's a lot of a lot there's a lot of stuff out there that when i listen to it on high volume it's it it starts to hurt my ears after a little while and i kind of want to just turn the volume down and i think with our stuff it's kind of about avoiding that so that even when you do blast it it's still pleasant to listen to so i think in that in that sense we kind of focus on like the lower end of the spectrum and try to take it easy on the on the higher frequencies do you feel like you've had any pushback from people because you're not fully like participating in the loudness war has anyone ever been like dude your stuff's just not loud enough or or anything like that i don't think so no if anything there's pretty much everyone is kind of done with that at this point and we'd rather go to to this kind of point where we can just all agree that we don't have to push uh, our tracks that much anymore. I think it would make production a lot easier for people than mixing, mastering, all of it. I don't think we've ever really had any any pushback. Maybe yeah. maybe like from from myself comparing something once it's done to I don't know like a like like a crazy example like a noise jet track. But I feel like that's always unfair whenever I do that to myself. But I I keep on doing it and keep on comparing and you can't help it but be bummed out that it's just not as as loud as they can get it. But but that's 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 goals. You gotta have something something to chase. Not to say that we don't max and sausage a lot of things, but there is definitely more dynamic range than a lot of other, or I would say most other bass music out there. I think if we if we do end up saturating stuff, it's for a for a very specific. It's it's like a purposeful thing. Totally, totally. By the way, uh, I literally just sat through an earthquake, so if you hear my microphone knocking, that's literally what that is. It's been happening all day. I'm safe. Don't worry about me. Um, <laughs> all right. Do you sidechain compress everything or just like the main synths and bass related to like your sound effects and stuff? Just the just the main stuff. This is kind of like a template that I like to go with. I just have these two ready to go as soon as I open up FL Studio. The full kind of like heavier sidechain for for the sub obviously and some other things that I really want to duck when the when the kick or snare hit and then the lighter one is usually where I route synths up to here and there 
say, I don't think it's necessarily a good rule to be like, oh yeah, everything has to be sidechained, compressed to the kick as as a rule. It's for us, it's more like, does it need it or doesn't it? There's definitely been occasions where instinctively I'd start to sidechain something, but then if you take a moment and just think about it, like, does it really need it? And then taking it off again, it sounds like this sounds way nicer. I think at that point, if the if the mix allows for it, I definitely I definitely rather like keep the the amount of stuff that's being side chained to a minimum. I just do it if it's necessary. But I think there's also a point where you just overdo it. Like Luke said, not everything has to be has to be side chained. I saw something about um, the transient master that you automated. Uh, what's that for? Yeah, so I think I put that on there on Michael's vocal to lower the sustain during the verses to make it sound like just a little bit more tight and staccato rather than more like runny and flowy. So if you because if you lower the if you lower the the uh, sustain on on a vocal with like with any sort of transient master, you get very tight sounding words. Why do you choose the transient master over the compressor? Because I think if you want to to control the sustain, would it be better to use the compressor instead? I just really like the way that uh, the Native Instruments Transient Master sounded with it. That's all. It's also like lazy and incredibly easy <laughs> to do. How did the drop come to be? How did the sounds come to be? Basically, like if you could give me an overload of information on the drop, even down to useless information, that's like literally that's what I desire. It kind of started out with this little thing here. This uh, this. Cymetics chord loop. And like already kind of like cut it up here. Yeah, um, chopped and it up a little. With this kind of like reverse just, side like, chain. Yeah, just kind of like automating the volume of it. And I think besides super filtered. And like I, I literally just wanted that kind of, what is this, like 135 to 600 hertz? Just that kind of like nice mid when i when i had that i was kind of this is this is really cool i like that kind of one hit on every beat and then here at the end of the two bars it's kind of like double it up um that was kind of the idea for uh would end up being the main bass i used razor for Ooh, such a good choice yeah oh yeah i've i've had this for for years now and it's not necessarily something that that I think comes back in Kira tracks all the time, but it's just fun to every once in a while just pull it out and, and have some fun with it. And I think in this case, so just mute the chords real quick. This is the bass line. Which is the, uh, then some noise on top of it just to give it a little like it's a little like <laughs> right at the start. It stacks really well with the sub, but then if you if you compare it to the top layer, which has like a fair amount of attack to it, they kind of contradict each other. But I feel like it, it, it works quite nicely when everything else comes in. I guess negates the kind of delayed effect of it, but it still it still retains the kind of kind of groove that it has. And then these two notes here, as you can see, they're not on grid. That just kind of helps accentuate that feeling. I think. If anything, um, not quantizing everything on grid is like such a key aspect in almost every Kiro track nowadays. You got you to give like some sort of swagger or something to it. And every time you you quantize something to like a beat grid, it it, it kills it. And I I, really, I just watched the uh, the Nadal with Slumma Jack, and they were talking about that as well, which is is really nice to see. It, it's definitely cool to see that people are or other other artists are kind of opening up to the same. Same kind of approach. For those yeah. notes, are they taken from the like, like the root notes of the chords, or do you do by ear? Or these are just kind of done by ear. Um, the chords themselves, they do kind of um, follow it. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, this is pretty much the root note of the chords. Yeah. A B it without everything on there. Yeah, just as like a as a dry. <laughs> It's super thin on its own. So just going down the chain. So taking out some below so it doesn't clash with the sub. The Capitator from Sound Toys is another one that we like to use. It works really well on simple sine waves when you're just doing your subs, but also just kind of creates some really nice overtones and harmonics when when you just apply to to anything really. Then there's trash. Then the micro shifts was next. 
which is really what makes it so so wide. It also accentuates the attack a lot more. And there's a Maximus on here. A soft clipper, just to make sure that it doesn't go past the tail. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's that together with just a simple sine wave, which has, well, here you go, decapitator on it. I like to do that and then literally just low pass it. Let's see, this is at around like 140 hertz, pretty steep, which I can do here because because of that top layer, there's already so much going on over here that it doesn't really need much of those, um, doesn't need many of those harmonies. And then the noise um, is literally just some, some white noise being high passed. This is a fun little thing that I that I've had for as long as I can remember. Uh, the blue glitch. It's got a whole variety of effects, but currently it's being used for its bit crusher, just giving it quite literally a little bit of little bit of crunch. Yeah, and that all together forms the bass. And throughout the track, it's it's pretty consistent. The only thing that changes is that halfway through the drop, the razor instance goes to a goes to a different key than sub does. Is that playing the seventh? It is, yeah. It's basically playing the the seventh of that. So you know I said it. just kind of to kick up again after after the drum fill right here. Honestly, the, the drop all in all is quite quite compact, quite simple. If you look at what's going on, we have we have the bass, we have the chords, we have the uh, vocal chops right here. Like without all this on, it, it sounds uh, it sounds really really warped. It's mainly this uh, oxygen inflator and little ultra boy, little ultra boy, especially with the drive turn up here. OTT about seven percent on this uh, Valhalla room, so it's it's <laughs> not doing much, but the, it it is on. This filter is I'm sure there's an automation clip in the track somewhere. This is I think it's just for the turnaround. Same for the delay, which is. The same for the turnarounds, so like going uh, probably into the verse or the outro. This, this goes up through automation. This kind of echoes out nicely. The chops were interesting. I'm pretty. We went through quite a few iterations, didn't we? They were. They were yeah. all basically centered around that one first phrase of the of the vocal chop. It's centered around that, and then everything after that is what just kept changing and being altered. The call and response kind of thing going on. Why, why don't you using the, the vocal that has already been recorded like nice cleanly and instead of using the, the old soundbook from Post Malone? Because this is the, something that we, that we did before we received the, like, the clean vocal. We, we were working with a quite like, tight deadline. So just to make sure that we, we stayed ahead of things, this is something we uh, just already want to get done. And I think we both ended up liking it so much that it's almost kind of like we we were afraid that if we were going to do it with a clean vocal, it just wasn't going to come out the same way as it did here. Yeah, it doesn't. If we when we swap the uh, the vocals out, like just basically plug in Michael's vocal for the really warped, it loses so much character, and because it's dirty, is what helps makes it sound kind of cool when everything's it's in the mix and everything's happening around it you have no idea that it's like some warped diy acapella thing but yeah listen, listening to it solo it sounds kind of ugly in the mix the ugliness is what gives it character you mentioned you had a tight deadline for this so how many hours you reckon went into the entire project oh, of course not 28 but it's, it's probably not really 28 yeah. No, this is this is definitely with like all like breaks that have taken on this counted in. Um, yeah, I would say something closer to like fifteen, maybe. I don't think we spent more than a week's worth on this. So you guys prefer to work with MIDI more than bouncing out so audio in in case the like the other guy don't have the VST plugins. Okay, so like for example, uh, Luke has Keyscape. It's 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 great for it. It's got like what pianos, roads. It's it's got a ton yeah. of amazing any stuff. anything key related. I don't have that. So, so when he uses something from Keyscape, we'll usually leave the MIDI in here, and he'll also stem it out for me. So I'll end up having you know exactly what he had. But then if I want to change something about it, at least I still have the entire MIDI. I don't. It's honestly not that hard to work around. I gather you kind of bounce the project backwards and forwards, but do you? like have set things that one person works on and 
the other one doesn't work on or do you just freestyle that side of things it's whoever whoever does it best first or whoever edits it last so we're we're very rarely butting heads at least to a, a degree that's like unhealthy if i do something and then he edits it later or changes the sound design or if i change the sound design on something like it's we we both agree like oh yeah that was a good choice or like that was a good idea doing that so how did the the, the monster car release restart it we had a pack of like four or five songs when we first started kuro we spent probably like what eight months like really refining the sound like there are a ton of tracks like when we started working on music together and and, and made the like conscious effort of like okay we're gonna we're gonna be a duo we're gonna do this thing there are so many songs that do not sound like what kiro sounds like today that will probably never see the light of day because we spent so much time trying to figure out like okay what is our sound like what is what is the sound that's gonna define us after those many months of, of really working it down we had like four or five songs that had kind of like a cohesive sound and and matched this like branding that we wanted to put together and we were pitching those around to a bunch of labels and monster cat was one of them and uh they were super receptive on it yeah we, we've had a, a pretty pretty close relationship with them they're a great label to work with when we had our solo projects before kiro we we actually yeah we submitted music there and they never responded to us which was hilarious me and our manager trevor from little empire after they showed some initial interest in us we took a trip over to the Vancouver office and and had some meetings with them. Their A and Rs actually do listen. We're very close with their a, with their A and R team. I, I can tell you personally from being at the office, like they are listening to music and demos all the time to a degree that I would just get so fed up with bad music being sent to me. If you send it, they are listening, and if they like it, they they will get at you. I've been in the room plenty of times when uh, John, one of the head A and Rs, has like heard a demo from somebody who's a complete no name or just like a very new producer, and he's been like, "Whoa, like this is really cool," and he'll respond directly to them and make sure that they're like, "Hey, this is really interesting. Like, we want to hear more from you." I think a lot of new producers just become really discouraged and feel disenfranchised because they're very new and they pro- they probably send out a ton of demos and never get any response. So they're like, "Are the A and Rs even listening?" to my stuff and just be assured they they really are and they just get so many demos they can't just reply and say no to a hundred people the power that comes with following up and being consistent and keep coming back gracefully okay not creepily but gracefully keep coming back is it's just insane it's absolutely powerful you know and respectfully following up not oh i can't believe you didn't open this email i can't believe you didn't like this song i hate you i hate your brand you know nothing like that no as there's no room for that it's more so just being like if they don't get back at you you follow up if they still don't get back at you then you send the next song out when you're ready and you just keep going on the process because one or two things are going to happen they're either going to reach back out and talk to you or you're eventually going to get so good that they're going to reach back out and talk to you do you guys agree with that yeah sure absolutely yeah. there's it's it's very rare that you'll find someone who is so good that they're completely unnoticed by by labels and they don't get any recognition whatsoever like if 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 you're good enough and once you reach that level like the the recognition and and like notoriety people will start paying attention to you it's just this is how it works. Kind of bringing it back to the production side, you know, what is your favorite for both of you? So this can be two different answers unless you guys have the same opinion on this, but what is your favorite sound design technique that you guys love to do? May be, maybe in the song, may not be in the song, just in general, you're just like, man, I love sound designing this way. That's an int- I've never been asked that question. It's so funny. I, I joke about this all the time. Both of us do saying how like everything that's cool that ever happens in a Kiro song is a happy accident. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was not, <laughs> it was not purposeful at all. I mean, there are, there are plenty of times where things are incredibly purposeful. My favorite sound design technique is being like, oh, wait a minute, this is dope now. The classic, uh, or like, like, oh, I yeah, didn't accidentally to into this mix of channel, but hey, this is actually pretty cool. Accidentally selecting the wrong preset that's like a super aggressive on the processing. Honestly, I love cycling through trash presets until I get one that has like just, it's, it's in the realm of what I'm looking for and then refining it through there, using the convolver on there and then also using the little altar boy format uh, and drive knobs on things that aren't vocals, you can get some really ugly and weird sounding stuff. I think for me, it's either going to have to be the giving something swing by just not sticking to the grid. I've really come to, to like to work with that in the past few months, basically starting out with the simplest, simplest kind of sound and 
seeing where you can take that mainly through saturation basically and what i like about that is that it's essentially a, a really kind of like nasty effect to apply but i think if done well you can you can make something something beautiful out of that if that makes sense there's like doing it in a controlled way or or just kind of like experimenting with it i think sort of really great stuff can come from that and that's definitely something that you know i've had plenty of days where i just open up fl and i'll just start messing around with sounds just for the sake of it and see where i can come up with and that's that's for me one of the one of the like fun parts of, of music production. I'll definitely never get tired of that. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Did you guys have a good time? Absolutely. Yeah, Thank man. you for Thanks having us. Hey, Daw Nation. Hope you enjoyed this episode of In The Daw with Kiro. If you did, please like, comment, subscribe, and take the little notification bell. Also, if you are interested in watching all of the live streams of these episodes and being able to ask your own questions, make sure to check out the $5 a month Patreon tier that we have going on. Plus, we always bring a patron on the show so that they can be the artist just like Quinn did in this episode. Also, if you are interested in private lessons in electronic music production or social media marketing, there are links down in the description. Finally, we recreated the bass that Kiro talked about in this episode, so if you want to download it for free, there is a link in the description. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode of In The Daw. Don't forget to check out our companion podcast, Behind The Daw. You can listen to that on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Deezer, YouTube, SoundCloud, and anywhere else that hosts podcasts. But Daw Nation, again, thank you so much, and we'll catch you in two weeks when we release our next episode with AU5.